ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage John J. DeJoya, President of Georgetown University, Milan Verveer, Executive Director, Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security, and His Ex Excellency Anders Fo Rasmussen, NATO Security General. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Georgetown. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning for this very special ceremony toward the 2014 Hillary Rodham Clinton Award from Georgetown for advancing women in peace and security. We've come together today to recognize an outstanding leader, to affirm the importance of women, peace, and security in global diplomacy and development, and to engage in a conversation on the role that organizations like NATO can play in ensuring that women's rights are protected and women's voices are heard. I'd like to thank all of you for being here and especially the members of our diplomatic corps who have joined us this morning. And I also wish to offer a special welcome to our awardee this morning, Secretary General Anders Foe Rasmussen, the 12th and current Secretary General of NATO, former Prime Minister of Denmark, and an inspiring champion of integrating women comprehensively in conflict resolution and peace building through NATO. I'd like to offer our gratitude to the Secretary General for being with us today and for offering his remarks. In receiving our 2014 Hillary Rodham Clinton Award for advancing women, peace, and security, Secretary General Rasmussen joins British Foreign Secretary William Haig and Dr. Dennis McWeggie, the founder of the Ponzi Hospital in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who we had the honor of recognizing last month in Gaston Hall. In these awards, which honor Secretary Clinton's legacy of leadership in the promotion of women's rights and her distinguished career of public service, we recognize the significance of, of ensuring that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights, as Secretary General said, as Secretary Clinton said in her landmark 1995 address at the UN Fourth World Conference in Beijing. In December 2011, we had the privilege of welcoming Secretary Clinton to campus for the launch of the U.S. National Action Plan for Women peace and security. Today she serves as honorary founding chair of our Institute for Women, Peace and Security. And we're here today for this award ceremony because of the work of this institute, its leadership, the urgency of its mission, its substantive impact. Already in its first year, the initiative has convened leaders, scholars and practitioners in dialogue. It has provided a context for students to more deeply engage these issues, it has undertaken research to advance the broader dialogue on the role of women in, in conflict and peace building. And it has provided our community this meaningful way to recognize the contribution of leaders from around the world and their work to advance women in peace and security. The work of this institute is led by Ambassador Milan Verveer and resonates profoundly with our community as a Catholic and Jesuit institution animated by a deep commitment to social justice and the responsibility that we have to prepare our young women and men to address challenges that threaten peace, security, and human dignity. There's perhaps no one better suited to lead this effort than Ambassador Verveer, the first ever ambassador at large and director of the State Department's Office for Global Women's Issues. A pioneer in the promotion of human rights for women, Ambassador Verveer has played a formative role in the establishment of women's issues as diplomatic and development priorities for the United States. We're very excited by the work that the Institute has been able to accomplish over this past year. I'd like to express my deep appreciation to Milan and to all of you who have had a role in advancing it. And ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to welcome to the podium Ambassador Milan Verveer. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, 
let me add my welcome uh, to that of President DeJoyas and a very special welcome indeed to the uh, Secretary General. We're so happy to have you with us today. In 2010, I had the opportunity to participate in a conference in Copenhagen on the role of women in global security. It was co-sponsored by the Danish and United States governments. And I'm delighted that Lori Fulton, the former US ambassador to Denmark, who organized the conference with her Danish colleagues, uh, is here with us today. The keynote speaker at the conference was no other than today's honoree. In his compelling address, which I well remember, he underscored the important role that women can and must play in preventing conflict and in building peace. And he described the ways in which NATO was incorporating that perspective and women's participation in its overall operations. And it is for his exemplary leadership at NATO in advancing women, peace, and security that we honor him today. Because of important NATO meetings that were taking place at the time of our earlier award ceremony, he could not be with us then. But we're delighted he is here today, and we want him to hear what Secretary Clinton had to say about him. Could we please roll the video clip? I do want to say a few words about Secretary General Rasmussen. He has boldly led NATO's efforts to integrate women, peace, and security into the alliance's operations. He understands, he was after all Prime Minister of Denmark, he understands that women are agents of change and drivers of progress, not just victims and survivors. Getting anything done in an organization like NATO, which is run by consensus, which means every member has to agree is not easy. But the Secretary General has a talent for helping allies come together to make good decisions. Secretary Clinton very much regrets she can't be with us today, uh, Secretary General, but she does send you her congratulations and her best wishes. And now, if you would please come forward with President DeJoya we will have the presentation of the award. For the citation, for recognizing the role that NATO can and must play in fulfilling the vision of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and the role of women in conflict resolution and peace building for his leadership in establishing a NATO action plan on women, peace, and security, and for his commitment to its comprehensive implementation throughout NATO operations, for appointing a special representative focused on this timely and critical issue, and for leading by example Georgetown University is proud to present the 2014 Hillary Clinton Award for Advancing Women in Peace and Security to the Secretary General of NATO, Anders Vo Rasmussen. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I am very pleased to be back at this great academic institution, and I am deeply honored to receive this distinction. So let me start by thanking President De Joya, Milan Ferver, and the Georgetown Institute 
for women, peace and security. Um, and I'm also very pleased uh, that Ambassador Fulton uh, is uh, among us uh, today. I still remember the Copenhagen conference uh, that uh, Milan Verveer uh, mentioned. I also want to salute the woman who has given her name to this award, Hillary Clinton. A powerful voice for peace, for democratic freedoms, and for human rights. Hillary is an inspiration for us all. She challenges us all to show leadership on the vital issues of women, peace, and security. She has consistently encouraged NATO to lead by example, and that's exactly what we have done. It is, of course, a challenging task. Armed conflict often hits women and children harder than men. They lose access to basic services, to education and economic opportunities, and increasingly, they are subjected to sexual violence. The harsh reality is that in many conflicts, in many conflict areas today, it is more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier. Many conflicts persist because peace talks break down because agreements are ignored, and because parties find it easier to fight than to negotiate. Time and again, women find themselves marginalized in these processes, and they don't get a chance to make their views known. But if women do not play an active part in making peace and in keeping peace, then the needs and interests of half of the world's population are not taken into account. So it is vital that we continue to develop our understanding of how women are affected by conflict and how they can be a prominent part of their resolution. Not sometimes, but every time. And it's important for me to stress that we should not regard women only as victims, but first and foremost as assets. United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 was adopted almost 14 years ago. Since then, we have made progress in ensuring that women are able to assume their rightful place in matters of peace and security, particularly at NATO. NATO's 20 years of experience in challenging missions and operations has shaped the way we view the role of women in peace and security. And none more so than our engagement in Afghanistan, where we have helped Afghan women and girls to exercise their rights, and increasingly also to shape the future of their country. Female experts, both military and civilian, continue to play an important part in our mission, to ensure that commanders at all levels take women's perspectives into account, to provide additional lines of communications to local communities which are not open to male soldiers, to help build trust and confidence, and to alert commanders to the specific needs of women and girls, including for basic services and health and education. Women in uniform lead patrols. They conduct security checks. And they provide medical care 
to the local populations as well as our own troops. They make a tremendous difference. And they demonstrate our commitment to the values we hold dear. Because customs, traditions, and social norms must be respected. Perhaps even more importantly, during conflict. We have also encouraged Afghan women to join the country's military and police. Over 2,000 women are now part of the security force. That may not sound like many, but for a country like Afghanistan, it is a visible change for the better. Since 2001, the lives of millions of Afghan men, women, and children have improved. Life expectancy has gone up. Maternal mortality has gone down. Over three million girls now attend school from almost none under the Taliban. And women make up 27% of the members of the parliament. This is more than in any other country in the region. And in fact, it's more than in some Western countries. On my many trips to Afghanistan, I have met remarkable women. Women who are activists, entrepreneurs, or politicians. They are brave, they are ambitious. My main message to them is this. Play your full part in building a better Afghanistan. And play your full part in this year's crucial elections as voters, candidates, observers, and in the forces that will secure the elections. All Afghans now have the chance to decide their own future and develop their own country. It is an opportunity they must seize to preserve the gains that we have made together. But of course, NATO's work to advance women's roles in peace and security is not limited to crises and conflicts, nor should it be. We have also worked hard to integrate the principles of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 into our other activities. We now ensure that gender-related considerations are part of our military planning, as well as the education, training, and exercising of our forces. We work closely with the United Nations and other international organizations and with over 40 partner countries on five continents to share experiences and best practices, to learn from each other, and to make sure that we complement and reinforce each other's efforts. Last but not least, more women now than ever before are actively shaping NATO policies and putting them into practice. For the first time in NATO's history, I have appointed several women in senior positions at our headquarters in Brussels. And I will continue to push for women to take their rightful place in our alliance. 18 months ago, Mari Skorre, a senior diplomat from Norway, became my special representative for women, peace, and security. Having someone like Mary in a dedicated permanent position gives a face and a voice to this vital issue. Every day, Mary makes sure that we keep women, peace, and security high on NATO agenda. Women are in key positions in NATO and taking key decisions. This was very clear to me last month when I chaired a meeting of Alliance defense ministers. 
I was pleased to see a record number of women sitting around the table. A picture of them together captioned, Power Women at NATO went viral on Twitter. It didn't get quite as many hits as uh, the Oscar selfie, uh, but it was a powerful image of how far we have come. Ladies and gentlemen, for well over six decades, NATO has protected our shared security and our common values. By reaching out to our neighbors after the end of the Cold War, we worked tirelessly to advance the vision of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. And we have spread stability across the entire Euro-Atlantic region. But recent events in Ukraine have shown that we cannot take that security and stability for granted, and that we need to stand up for our values. We have seen Russia rip up the international rule book, trying to redraw the map of Europe and creating, in just a few weeks, the most serious security crisis since the end of the Cold War. This sort of behavior goes against international norms, and it simply has no place in the 21st century. NATO allies stand with Ukraine we stand by Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We stand by the right of every nation <clears throat> to decide its own future. And we will continue to support all constructive efforts for a peaceful solution in accordance with international law. In this crisis, as in any other, the link between North America and Europe is the foundation of our strength. This transatlantic bond remains vital for both sides of the Atlantic to deal with the serious challenges we face. That is why NATO matters for America and for Europe because we are stronger within the alliance than we can ever be alone. In September, we will hold our next NATO summit in Wales in the United Kingdom. This is an important opportunity to take tough decisions in view of the long-term strategic implications of today's crisis and to shape an alliance that is fully fit to provide security for your generation, just as it has done for Hillary's and mine. We will make clear that our commitment to the security of allies is unbreakable. We will take decisions about NATO's operations and capabilities what more we need to do to prepare for future security challenges, and to offer our partners around the world greater opportunities to consult, decide, and act with us, so that we ensure that NATO remains an anchor of stability in an unpredictable world. But we will not forget that our greatest asset will always be our people, the courageous, hardworking, smart women and men in our civilian and military ranks. They embody our values and our way of life. They are the true strength of the world's strongest alliance. We want to continue 
to inspire all those men and women. And we want to continue to inspire and call upon people like you. Georgetown has an excellent tradition of service. It is a renowned institution on international affairs, and it is a preeminent educator of our next generation of leaders. Young men and women from across this country and around the globe, young people who are hungry to shape their world, to make a difference, and to make the future better for all of us. I expect you will rise to the challenge. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for that set of eloquent remarks. Uh, he's got tremendous demands on his schedule, as you can imagine, with the crises that were uh, discussed here uh, this morning, but he has nevertheless agreed uh, to take a few questions. Uh, we ask that whoever is interested uh, come up to the microphone. And while that is happening, perhaps I can start with a question on Afghanistan, which you also discussed uh, this morning. We know that the NATO-led IFAS force will be concluding its current mission at the end of the year uh, as Afghanistan assumes full responsibilities for its security. Uh, and we're pleased to have the Afghan ambassador to the United States here with us this morning. Uh, welcome, Mr. Hakimi. Uh, and there are obviously questions about whether or not a security agreement will get signed uh, that will enable NATO uh, and, and its forces to uh, be able to uh, continue in an advisory and a training mode. Uh, similarly, you discuss the very important role that women in Afghanistan have played, and thank you for the kind of support uh, that NATO has rendered and demonstrated. Uh, but there are tremendous fears uh, on the part of the women there that the great strides that they have made will be reversed uh, as this transition goes forward, and they will not be able to play the role they've been playing in advancing the peace uh, stability of the country. So how do you see uh, the possibilities for uh, the future agreement uh, in terms of the security arrangements going forward after Afghanistan assumes full responsibilities, and how do you see uh, the prospects for women in Afghanistan? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Let me go directly to the bottom line. I think the bottom line is we will get a security agreement. We will get a signature on the security agreement. Um, but I don't think President Karzai will sign. Uh, so it will be for a new president uh, to sign. I'm confident we will get a security agreement because a lot is at stake. It's not only about security, uh, but obviously if we don't get a security agreement in place, we cannot deploy a training mission after 2014. So if there is no signature, there will be no troops. It is as easy as that. Mm -hmm. But um, it goes beyond security because if we have no troops on the ground, I think it will be difficult to generate financial resources to sustain the Afghan security forces after 2014. We have built Afghan security forces to a level of around 350,000 soldiers and police. This goes far beyond the financial capacity of the Afghan government. So if they don't get international financing, they can't pay the salaries. That would be a very, very, um, I would say dangerous situation because it might, in the worst case, lead to a dissolution uh, of uh, the Afghan security forces. Uh, and um, uh, we would see the security situation deteriorate. I think the Afghans are very well aware of this. And that's why we have seen all presidential candidates uh, express support uh, for the security agreement. We also saw last uh, November 
uh, the lawyer Diega, uh, express a very clear, clear view uh, that they want the security agreement to be signed as soon as possible. So for these reasons, I do believe we will uh, see uh, the security agreement um, signed and we will be able to deploy a training mission uh, from 1st of January 2015. As regards women's rights, it is a matter of concern, uh, but um, the Afghan government has committed itself to protect human rights, uh, including, of course, uh, women's uh, rights, uh, and, and that pledge uh, was uh, delivered uh, at several conferences in Bonn, in Kabul, in Tokyo, uh, and seen from the international community's perspective, it is a mutual commitment. We have committed to su support Afghanistan after 2014, also financially, with development assistance. Mm -hmm. But in exchange, uh, we would expect uh, uh, the Afghan government to protect also women's rights. Uh, and to put it very bluntly, uh, if um, women's rights are put in danger, in Afghanistan, I think it will be very, very difficult to generate financial resources uh, in many countries mm -hmm. uh, to support the Afghan government. So also in that respect, a lot is at stake, and that's why I'm confident uh, whoever will be elected president um, uh, this year, uh, the new government uh, will um, protect uh, women's rights. Thank you for that. Uh, now to our, our questions. And please give us your name and uh, the school you're in. Hi, Secretary General. Thank you very much for taking the time to come to Georgetown. My name is Dominique Gilbert. I'm an evening program public policy student here. And by day, I work at Homeland Security in our multilateral engagement. Uh, my question for you is, well, I appreciated what you were saying about the importance of respecting the customs of, of the countries working with. And from, from your perspective, what do you think are the, um, the first steps in dealing with the cultures that are very different from Western cultures? And then secondly on that is, do you see any lacking research that would be helpful to put forward when, when trying to work in these complex situations and trying to encourage governments to include women? Uh, yeah, there's quite complicated questions actually. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on research, I, I will leave it to experts, uh, actually, to um, elaborate uh, on, 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 on that. Uh, no, doubt, no doubt that there is a potential uh, for uh, further um, uh, research activities. Uh, I, I suppose it's about uh, women's role uh, in uh, preventing conflicts and in uh, the resolution uh, of uh, conflicts. Um, um, we know, uh, re relating this uh, second part of your question to the first part of your question, uh, we know that women play a, a very particular role in, 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 in these uh, societies. Uh, they have a very strong role in the family, they have a very strong role in the local uh, community, and this is the reason why it's so essential to draw upon uh, 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 women and their uh, uh, human assets uh, in uh, preventing conflicts and uh, in the resolution of uh, uh, conflict. Um, and uh, no doubt, without being an expert in, in research, uh, no doubt uh, that further research in, in that area uh, could uh, strengthen um, the focus uh, on women's uh, role in uh, peace and um, uh, security. Now, on the first um, part of uh, your question, um, it, of course, it, it is a balance. Let's use Afghanistan uh, as, uh, as an example. I, I mentioned that it's of utmost importance to respect uh, local traditions, uh, local uh, uh, culture, um, and of course, that also goes when it comes to the, the role of, um, of, of women. But on the other hand, we belong to a culture uh, where we do believe uh, that uh, women have equal rights. 
Uh, and, and obviously, we can't and shouldn't suppress that. Um, so, though it's a delicate balance, we should, of course, promote um, uh, women's rights, even in a, in a conservative society where uh, uh, women's rights uh, has, have not been the focal point. Uh, and that's why I mentioned the examples from Afghanistan, because we have actually, I think, achieved uh, a lot. Um, when I meet female politicians in Afghanistan, I'm struck by uh, their determination uh, to promote um, uh, women's interests and, uh, and women's rights. Uh, when I meet a female journalist, I can assure you uh, that they do a tremendous job uh, to protect uh, women's interests and, and women's rights. And I have met uh, uh, female entrepreneurs, uh, and, and they have been very creative uh, in establishing new, uh, new businesses. So um, that's also, that gives me some optimism. When I meet uh, the young generation, when I meet um, young women, uh, in Afghanistan, I feel confident, they will never ever accept to return uh, to the darkness uh, of the past uh, under, uh, under, the, under the Taliban. So it's a balance. We have to be prudent in the way we approach this issue, but we should not compromise on our basic uh, belief uh, that women uh, have uh, equal rights and we should promote uh, these rights, also in these societies. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope here at the Institute we're going to add to that research data and scholarship base uh, on this yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to this side. <coughs> um, hi. Thank you for coming here as well. Um, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm in the School of Foreign Service. Um, so I share your optimism in that the security agreement with um, Afghanistan will be reached you know, in the next year. Um, but do you think um, that, say, um, in a situation in the near future where perhaps NATO isn't directly on the ground but only provides financial support um, to the um, Afghan security forces, do you consider, do you think that it is, um, that the structures that are in place to help women in Afghanistan are sustainable without direct NATO or US military support? And I only ask this because it does seem that there is a correlation between um, uh, you know, the, you know, a mili uh, military presence in Afghanistan and the um, improvement in the rights of women. Thank you. <clears throat> um, first, let me stress <clears throat> that I, I am indeed uh, very impressed uh, by uh, the capability uh, of uh, the Afghan uh, security forces. They have now been in the lead uh, of security um, uh, since uh, mid-2013, uh, uh, and uh, they have dealt uh, with uh, security uh, challenges in a very uh, professional manner. So that's why we are confident that they will be able to take full responsibility for the security all over Afghanistan by the end of this year as planned. But having said that, we also believe that they will um, need our assistance um, for some time when it comes to uh, training, advice, um, uh, uh, and that's why we have offered uh, to establish a, a NATO-led uh, training mission uh, after uh, 2014. Um, so if, if we are not able to is, uh, establish that training mission, uh, my concern is uh, that um, they will lack that uh, training, advice, assistance uh, that we could uh, provide. But more seriously, as I indicated, they will also lack funding. Uh, and, and I think that's the real, that's the real problem. Uh, if the international community is not willing uh, to 
sustain the Afghan security forces financially, uh, it, it, it will be, uh, to, to go directly to the point, it will be impossible uh, for the Afghan government to sustain uh, the Afghan security forces. And in that case, uh, uh, the security situation uh, in Afghanistan uh, may deteriorate. Uh, or, or, so, um, let me stress what I said in my answer to the first question, that I feel confident that we will get the signature uh, and will be able uh, to uh, uh, deploy a training mission after 2014. So f hopefully your question is a hypothetical question. Thank you. Next. <coughs> Hello, Secretary General. Uh, thank you again for coming here today. And my name is Leo Luo. I'm a student in the F School of Foreign Service. My question is, what do you see as the most pressing security challenge facing the world in the new f near future? And could you explain NATO, what you're, how you see NATO's role in it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you had asked me two months ago, uh, my answer might have been different from what I will uh, answer today. And well, that's maybe both answers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, that's exactly what I will do, because um, we, are, we are where we are now. Uh, so right now, seen from a NATO perspective, um, uh, the, the crisis in Ukraine uh, is uh, the most pressing uh, security uh, challenge uh, right now, uh, also because it goes to the heart uh, of um, uh, what uh, NATO is about. Uh, NATO uh, is about ensuring um, security and stability uh, in the Euro-Atlantic uh, area. And what we have seen in Crimea uh, is um, a threat uh, to security and stability uh, in the Euro-Atlantic uh, area. So, so Right now, <clears throat> this is actually uh, the most severe security uh, challenge. If you had asked me <clears throat> uh, two, uh, two months ago, uh, I would have uh, pointed to maybe a range uh, of uh, uh, security uh, challenges, uh, including, of course, um, uh, uh, Syria, uh, including <clears throat> the risk of uh, nuclear uh, proliferation. I could mention Iran um, as, as an example. Uh, the risk uh, of uh, cyber attacks. The reason why I now point to, uh, or the fact that I now point to Ukraine as the most pressing security challenge shouldn't overshadow, uh, that we still have these uh, other <clears throat> uh, security risks and, and security uh, challenges. And, and that boils down to the conclusion that NATO as the world's m strongest military alliance should be prepared for all uh, eventualities, whether it is a security challenge in our near uh, neighborhood or even uh, in uh, cyberspace. Um, and that's <clears throat> why <clears throat> uh, we are uh, right now working on an enhanced uh, cyber defense. We are building uh, a NATO missile defense system uh, to protect our populations against uh, potential uh, missile attacks, just to uh, mention a couple uh, of examples. Mm -hmm. uh, so this work will continue uh, despite the fact that right now uh, our allies are, for good reasons, very much focused uh, on the crisis uh, in Ukraine. Thank, Thank you. you. Next. Uh, good morning, Madam Ambassador, Mr. Secretary General. My name is Michelle Barsa. I work for a DC-based NGO called the Institute for Inclusive Security. It's focused exclusively on women, peace, and security. There are a number of people in this room who've dedicated a lot of attention to thinking about how to institutionalize attention to women, peace, and security within US defense operations. 
And one of the ways we've approached thinking about that is integrating it into national level strategic guidance. So for us, the national security strategy, insofar as it informs the national military strategy and the guidance for the employment of forces. I'm wondering if you can draw parallels for us um, for the NATO experience. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how these attention to these issues has been integrated into the highest level strategic guidance. And I'm also particularly curious about the space for uh, amending and revising NATO's contingency plans for attention to women, peace, and security, if you think that's viable, and if NATO might commit to doing that, and if not, what you think the other strategic entry points are. That's a very comprehensive uh, <laughs> Another question. Lecture. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but maybe I, I, I could best um, answer uh, the question by describing um, uh, some, some of our uh, major strategic um, uh, documents. The overall document uh, is um, um, the NATO strategic concept. Uh, we uh, adopted a new uh, strategic concept uh, in Lisbon, at our summit in Lisbon in November 2010. Um, in that strategic concept, uh, we defined uh, three core tasks for NATO. First, uh, collective defense. Secondly, crisis management. Uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, cooperative uh, security. Uh, collective defense, uh, that is of course the traditional uh, territorial defense of our populations uh, and our uh, member states, and, and you will see during the current uh, Ukraine crisis a lot of focus uh, on, on that specific uh, task. Crisis management, um, uh, you have seen a recent example on that, um, namely Libya uh, in uh, 2011. Uh, Libya is out of area. Uh, it is an example that uh, uh, the UN Security Council adopted an historic resolution, responsibility to protect uh, the Libyan population against attacks from its own government. NATO decided to take responsibility for that uh, operation. That is uh, an example of uh, crisis uh, management. And uh, cooperative security, uh, that's very much about uh, our uh, partnerships we realize that if we are to accomplish uh, our security mission in today's world, we need strong security partnerships across the globe. So we have signed partnership agreements with countries like Australia and uh, Japan, and uh, we have strong partnerships with uh, New Zealand and uh, South Korea. Um, uh, in today's world, um, I think it's safe to say no one can go it alone, even the strongest nation, needs collaborators to give political legitimacy as well as operational uh, strength. And we see that in Afghanistan with uh, a coalition of 50 nations, uh, 28 allies and 22 uh, partners. So that's our overall um, uh, strategic uh, con concept. Uh, and underneath, uh, we have uh, other um, uh, strategic uh, documents. Uh, we transform the strategic concept into concrete uh, uh, military plans. You mentioned contingency uh, plans. As a matter of principle, we never comment uh, on uh, concrete contingency plans, but I can assure you that we have all plans in place uh, to effectively protect and defend all uh, NATO allies against all possible uh, uh, threats. And attention to women, peace, and security within them? Uh, beg your pardon? Attention to women, peace, and security within them? Yeah, but uh, that's an integrate, as, as I described it uh, in my introduction uh, this, this morning, um, uh, that's now uh, mainstreamed uh, in um, uh, our policies, uh, in um, uh, uh, our military uh, plans. Um, uh, so so and that's actually the, the essence of uh, uh, our 
approach uh, that it should be an integrated part uh, of our uh, strategic documents and our concrete uh, military plans. And this will have to be the last question. In the uh, School of Lifelong Learning, uh, it's not a Georgetown school, uh, maybe it is. <laughs> in any case, uh, back when they were in power, the Taliban managed to eliminate poppy growing almost overnight with very few resources other than a few working telephones uh, under NATO with all its tremendous resources. Afghanistan has become the opium capital of the world. How do you explain that? Well, actually, it is the Taliban that profits uh, from the uh, poppy uh, production and poppy uh, cul cultivation. Um, um, the fact is that it is the Afghan government uh, that has responsibility uh, for dealing uh, with uh, the poppy uh, cultivation. Uh, it's, it's not part of ISAF's uh, mandate. Um, um, and um, it is, uh, I, I, let me be honest with you, I also consider it uh, a major uh, problem. And of course it's disappointing to see uh, the, the, the development. But I also have to tell you that uh, it's not that easy to solve the problem. Sometimes uh, we we are advised that we should just eliminate uh, the poppy fields. But it's not that easy, uh, because if you um, destroy uh, the poppy fields uh, without providing farmers with an alternative and sustainable uh, livelihood, then you'll just push them. Uh, into the camps uh, of uh, the Taliban. So the way to reduce uh, poppy cultivation in Afghanistan is to provide farmers uh, with uh, uh, crops uh, that are more profitable uh, than uh, poppies. Uh, and, and that's a more complicated task and it's a more long-term uh, task. Of course, if you, you, you uh, destroy, if you burn down uh, all fields from one day uh, to the next, uh, then maybe you would feel some satisfaction that you have seen uh, a destruction uh, of uh, the poppy fields. Uh, but it's a very, very short-term short uh, solution uh, because if, if people are not provided with a sustainable alternative uh, livelihood, then... Uh, uh, you will end up uh, in, in, in a much worse uh, situation. So that's the explanation, but I, um, I, I share your frustration. Uh, and uh, among the mutual commitments, uh, the Afghan government uh, has made as part of the international conferences is that uh, the Afghan government will uh, intensify the fight uh, against uh, drugs uh, production and drugs uh, trade um, and hopefully they will live up to their commitments. Thank you very much and thank you for joining us again. I think the questions illustrate just a few of the challenges that uh, you have to address and our world confronts. So uh, we wish you well, we wish you Godspeed in all of these works and uh, Congratulations again, and thank you for all you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much.